Thank you for joining me for this lecture recital presentation of Patterns by Dr. Judith Shatton with text by Amy Lowell. This is the first in a series of musical performances celebrating the literary contributions of American women writers to the art song genre. My project is titled Little Women Long Shadows and tonight we will focus on one woman in particular, Amy Lowell, the quote, pugnacious dictator from New England. Amy Lowell's poem, Patterns, was originally published during World War I. Just over a century after its publication, soprano Amy Johnson commissioned Dr. Shatton to set this piece to music. It was premiered in September of 2019 by Johnson, along with pianist Kathleen Kelly. I will begin tonight's program with an introduction to my dissertation project and goals, then discuss Lowell's original poem, and then highlight the compositional choices made by Shatton, which enhance the poetic structure and dramatic interpretation of Lowell's original text. Following a brief intermission, I will then perform patterns with collaborative pianist Yingshan Su. I am so grateful to the musical community at the University of Maryland, faculty, staff, and students alike, for lending their support and encouragement for this project, and to my dissertation committee, friends and family, and students who have tuned in from afar this evening. I am simply thrilled to share this work with you. I also extend a hearty thank you to my steadfast advisors, Dolores Ziegler and Martha Randall, as well as to my collaborator, Yingshan Su, who creates such a beautiful garden for Lowell's character, as you will hear in tonight's performance. My goal for this dissertation is to celebrate women's contribution to classical song literature from either the perspective of a woman telling her own story or a woman reflecting the female experience in its many guises through poetry and prose. Carol Kimball defines art song as, quote, a hybrid form fashioned of two sister arts, end quote. Poetry and music are indeed sister art forms. We even use similar terminology, words like meter, rhythm, accent, and phrasing to describe each of them. The real magic of this hybrid is that in performance, we hear not the separate components but one unified musical story. While I have yet to find an art song that I don't like, the works that really resonate with me are those in which the text has a personal and distinctly female narrative. It then becomes my mission, as singer and as a woman, to become the character in the story and give voice to her narrative. One of my earliest encounters with this female experience in song was as an undergraduate student studying Robert Schumann's song cycle, Frauenliebe und Leben. My 19-year-old self was enthralled with the cycle until I learned, much to my chagrin, that this landmark work depicting a woman's life, love, and purpose therein was not just composed by a man, but incorporated poetry written by a man as well. While I still adore this song cycle and do believe it is an important piece in the German leader canon, this, I don't believe, is an authentic representation of the female experience. Consequently, I am highly motivated to seek repertoire that has this woman's voice. And I am not alone in this mission. I am encouraged by the multitude of new initiatives conceived to promote women in music and I hope this dissertation brings to light songs worth singing and stories worth telling by women worth celebrating. As Anne Elliot, the protagonist in Jane Austen's novel Persuasion, argues, men have had every advantage of us in telling their own story. The pen has been in their hands. When Dr. Judith Shatton, Professor Emerita at the University of Virginia, suggested I look at her monodrama for soprano and piano, titled Patterns, 
I realized I had found an ideal piece for this project. This piece was also my first introduction to Amy Lowell, the poet. The more I learned about Lowell's poetic style, eccentric life, and penchant for drama, the more I wanted to bring her work to life. And I realized that if my goal was to find songs with stories worth telling, I would first need to find the writers writing those stories. Have you ever tried to Google women poets in song? It does not yield narrow search results. Even adding the parameters of American women poets in song is like drinking from a fire hose. So I decided at first to select just one other poet to compliment Amy Lowell, and there was no better option than Emily Dickinson, whose poetry has long been associated with and is the inspiration for hundreds, if not thousands, of musical works. My entire second recital is dedicated to Emily Dickinson text settings. And for the final grouping for this project, I wanted to curate a survey of women writers representing a wide array of social strata, which I have deemed class, and a wide array of outspokenness, which I have deemed sass. In case you are confused about where we are in this project, we are here. To begin tonight's program, we first need an introduction to Amy Lowell, born and raised in Brooklyn, Massachusetts. The Lowell family was already an established name in the Boston area. They were descendants of Percival Lowell, who immigrated to America in 1639. Our poet's father's predecessors, the founders of Lowell, Massachusetts, had made their fortune in cotton, and her mother's family, the Lawrences, were similarly employed in textiles in, surprise, surprise, Lawrence, Massachusetts. I think you can spot the pattern. Lowell's great-grandfather was among the founders of the Boston Athenaeum Library. Her grandfather was the first trustee of the Lowell Institute. James Russell Lowell, the first editor of the Atlantic Monthly and, quote, wittiest of New England poets, was her grandfather's cousin. Four generations of Lowells served as Harvard College Fellows, and Abbott Lawrence Lowell, one of her brothers, was the president of Harvard. Finally, Percival Lowell, another brother, was an astronomer who mathematically proved the existence of Pluto in 1905. Clearly, this is a family of both the arts and the sciences. Amy Lowell was born and raised, the youngest of five surviving children, in the family home, which was called Seven Elves, and named thusly for the seven Lowells who lived in the house. So, Seven Elves. Lowell was a woman of contrasts. She was feminine and masculine vigor. That's how Louis Untermeyer, literary critic, fan, and friend, described her. Lowell herself used terms such as robust and delicate. She was a spectacle to behold at only five feet tall and more than 200 pounds. This physique would have been, in the late 1800s, extremely unusual. Lowell tried many extreme dieting measures and even took a trip to Egypt to follow a regimented health plan, but nothing met with success. It was assumed, therefore, that her weight gain was due to hormonal imbalances. Lowell commented fre frequently on her own appearance, calling herself a walking sideshow. But her lively, brazen personality and forceful presence won out over any physical anomalies. She attended 60 dinners given in her honor in 1891, the year of her formal coming out into society. She was a bombastic, loud personality. She smoked cigars like a man and kept, according to Untermeyer, an armada of immense English sheepdogs. Her daily routine, or more aptly named her nightly routine, for she was essentially nocturnal, was to awaken at 3 p.m., breakfast at 4 p.m., 
hold meetings and take care of business until dinner time at 8 p.m. Sometimes she entertained guests for dinner, but the guests knew to leave by 11.30 because at midnight her writing began and she would continue writing until 6 a.m., at which point she would go to sleep. As an adult, she lived in Seven Elves with Ada Dwyer Russell, widely known to be her partner. Tenacious and prolific in her short lifetime, she published six volumes of poetry, two volumes of literary criticism, a two-volume biography of John Keats, and numerous articles, literary responses, and commentary for public consumption. She also studied and lived abroad and toured the United States, giving lectures, hosting poetry readings, and promoting her publications. And during her poetry readings, she would ask friends to stand behind a curtain so that they could make sound effects to accompany her poetry readings. Quite dramatic. While T.S. Eliot dubbed her, quote, the demon saleswoman, I like to think of her more as a female Churchill, moving with veracity, purpose, and great passion. Patterns the Poem was written in 1915 and was included in Lowell's book, Men, Women, and Ghosts, published in 1916. It is strongly influenced by Imagist poetry. Imagism is an English and American poetic movement that became popular in response against French symbolism in the early 20th century. Lowell, being the straight shooting and blunt to a fault character that she was, expressed frustration at esoteric symbolic meaning in French poetry and championed imagism instead, which often included free verse and natural speech patterns as opposed to iambic verse. Although imagists denied being visual artists, they certainly did try to make a reader see a scene with very descriptive language and the use of precise imagery. The movement was spearheaded by Ezra Pound, who, it turns out, was not a fan of Amy Lowell, who eventually took over the imagist movement. Pound referred to Lowell's works and those who admired Lowell as amygists, a lesser version of the true imagist ideal. In patterns, we see a wealthy woman walking through her garden, comparing the restrictions of her garments with the restrictions placed on women in a patriarchal society. During the poem, we, the audience, learn that her betrothed, named Lord Hartwell, has been killed in battle, fighting for a cause he did not believe in, but was forced to join. The woman begins the poem in her garden, comfortably governed by rules of society, but as she becomes increasingly aware of her place and her limitations, descends into despair and melancholy. Like many poets of her time, Lowell was deeply affected by the Great War, and much of her literature of this period includes references to bombs, bloodshed, loss, and death. Lowell frequently references the female figure bathing, interwoven with, and often hiding in nature. The poem is bracketed beginning and end by images of rigidity and stiff structures like corsets and heavily brocaded fabrics, while the middle verses celebrate the natural sensuality of the human body beneath the clothing. Words including stiff, rigid, brocade, and patterned are mentioned 20 times throughout the poem. And words such as water, fluidity, sensuality, shade, appear 31 times. We also see a clear connection between nature as good, with the pinnacle of good being the lone lime tree in her garden, which casts a welcome shade from the blinding sun. Lowell, in the preface of her book, Men, Women, and Ghosts, wrote of how listening to Debussy's piano pieces, quote, showed her the close kinship of music and poetry, and Dr. Judith Shatton made good use of this in her setting of Lowell's text. Shatton's compositions are said to contain, quote, tonal elements twisted into new structures, 
creating work that is theatrical, even visceral, without resorting to cliches or purely programmatic devices. Her settings of patterns does not disappoint. I have identified four main atmospheric components developed by Shatton that appeared throughout the score, which create the scene of our story. The first component is that of a garden. Surprisingly, there are two gardens in this piece. The first is a real garden, where the woman walks along the gravel path. This soundscape is reminiscent of a tonal harmonic language. We recognize this as tuneful and can identify traditional arching melodies and phrasing. The second garden is imaginary. It is wild, sensual, and full of shadows beneath large fruit trees, specifically that lime tree. This is where the woman runs, skips, and slides. She does anything but walk down the gravel path. This garden is represented by a wash of a whole tone scale. The second component in this garden is the onomatopoetic sounds of nature. We hear daffodils and squills blowing. Flowers fluttering. and we hear water dripping and splashing. The third component is a gloomy sense of self-awareness, which the woman gradually perceives as the story unfolds. This sense of dread and entrapment is a petaled, descending figure. It also appears whenever the character realizes how trapped she is by the patterns of her life. is the absence of sound, or the distortion of pitch by scraping, plucking, or dampening the piano strings. The absence of a clear, harmonic soundscape is the equivalent of the woman leaving behind both the real and the imaginary garden. Though she may rail against the confines of the real garden, it at least provided a solid ground where she knew her role and her purpose. These distorted sounds appear when she is most disturbed. There are also two distinct rhythmic patterns in this piece reflected in Shatton's text setting. First, we hear what I call straight rhythms, patterns and text setting that adheres to the meter on the page. These on-the-beat entrances and melodies are those moments governed by society's rules and restrictions. For these examples, I will first read the text and then intone the text with Ying Shan playing. The first example is, I walk down the garden path. 
which matches the physical softness of skin. You can also see from this example that the top line has a stiffer or more angular melody with larger leaps and abrupt direction changes, while the bottom line is far more relaxed as the voice moves almost entirely stepwise within a single phrase. Here is another example of the stark contrast between social rigidity and natural fluidity, as she references the buttons of his waistcoat, which are shiny, decorative, and denote social status, along with the bruising of her body, which is natural, feminine, and fluid. And the buttons of his waistcoat bruised my body. We also have, in the woman's greatest moment of shock and devastation, a point at which she loses her ability to speak either naturally, meaning with the triplet or tied rhythm, or to follow society's rules. The text here is, up and down the patterned path in my stiff, correct brocade. Up and down the patterned paths in my stiff, correct representation of this moment where she loses control. At the top of this page, we can see that the woman is neither speaking with the tied notes of the relaxed natural garden, nor is she adhering to society's rhythm. By the time we reach the bottom of the page, however, the woman has returned to her stiff and correct brocade. Perhaps Amy Lowell's poems were not more widely set by composers of the 20th century 
because the 20th century soundscape was not ready for her over-the-top personality. As scholar Melissa Bradshaw explains, her poetry crackles with an exuberance and zeal that she deliberately refuses to rein in, end quote. Lowell herself declared that she is like an unruly vine. No matter how carefully she ties herself up, she keeps splitting and straying with every kind of extraneous colored flower at the end of her strayed branches. And Louis Untermeyer surmises that Lowell's neglect since her death is in direct proportion to her boisterousness in life. Perhaps it takes a special type of composer to add the layers of complexity, dimension, and character that Lowell's written works demand. Shatton's compositional style, as you will hear, has the capacity for this kind of depth. Perhaps the 21st century is Lowell's time, as we have never before encountered so much relaxation of, quote, traditional gender roles. I think there is great potential to see Amy Lowell reborn in 21st century American art song. Thank you very much for listening. We will now take a brief intermission to clear the stage and we'll return shortly for our performance. Thank you.